Good evening and welcome to Lightning Talks, presented by the Seattle Aquarium. I'm Jim Wharton. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning here at the Aquarium. Now, tonight we are coming to you live from the actual Seattle Aquarium here on the shores. I'm serious. This, it's, it is incredibly exciting. We've been doing Lightning Talks now for a couple of years. It's, I have missed a live audience. I've missed all of you. So thank you all for being here. The Seattle Aquarium, you know, we're, one of the, my favorite things to say about the Seattle Aquarium is that we stand knees deep in the Salish Sea. We are quite literally not on dry land at all. We are on the shores of Puget Sound in the traditional and contemporary territories of the Coast Salish people. And to be back with all of you again, it's, it's really exciting. Now, we have a tremendous program for you tonight. We are going to be, uh, we're going to be sort of exploring the mysterious and alluring kelp forests. Now, kelp forests are this incredibly dense and productive habitat, literally teeming with life. And they're really common in the, sort of these cool temperate waters all throughout the west coast of America and really in many places throughout the world but even and especially in the urban waters right here in Seattle, in Elliott Bay, right over the side of the Seattle Aquarium. Now, we have five speakers who are just champing at the bit to tell you more about all of the wonders of the kelp forest. Now, if you've never been to a Lightning Talks event before, here's what you have in store. Five speakers have five minutes each, to share one big idea and not one second more. Now they're gonna get a warning at one minute. They'll get another warning at 30 seconds and then they'll get one at time. And if they go over, they'll get this. It's very serious. Now, we want to keep things moving this evening, so we're not going to stop for a question and answer in between speakers. Uh, so if you have questions for any of the speakers online, please do drop those questions or comments into the chat. And for the folks who are here with us, jot them down on those sticky notes, or when you, we get to the Q&A period, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask those questions live to our, our speakers. Now. We are really excited to be here again, and we want to make sure that, you know, if you like programs like Lightning Talks, uh, please do consider a donation to the Seattle Aquarium. When you donate to the Seattle Aquarium, you're joining us in our mission of inspiring conservation of our marine environment. Now, I don't want to go on too much longer because I'm super excited uh, with our lineup this evening, and I'm especially excited to introduce our first speaker, Muckleshoot tribal member and frequent collaborator with the Seattle Aquarium, Valerie Seagrest. Uh, Valerie has been especially helpful for us with the, the design and planning of our new ocean pavilion expansion. And I'm really excited to hear what Valerie has to share with us about kelp. Valerie, are you ready to kick us off? I'm so ready to get this over with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have five minutes ready to go. Five minutes, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Are you saying go? Oh. Seaweeds are important food and medicine for humans everywhere that they grow. Historical uses of seaweeds date back long ago by humans, 14,000 years, or as some would say, since time immemorial. And for Coast Salish people, countless generations have harvested and utilized seaweeds for a variety of purposes, from thickening soups to seasoning dishes to creating fishing nets and long fish lines. They're especially valued because they're high in minerals and trace elements and protein. And we have a common saying in our culture that when the tide is out, the table is set. And that means, for some people, you might look at the, the shore and think about shellfish or fish or oysters and mussels and clams and barnacles, etc. all the things that grow out there in our gardens. But a variety of seaweeds are harvested from 
rainbow leaf to Turkish towel to bladder rack to nori to sea lettuce and to tonight's star of the show, kelp. So bullwhip kelp is a brown seaweed. It's got a distinctive globe and a lengthy hollow tube and it is one of the fastest growing plants in the sea. It can grow 12 inches a day, a foot a day. It's so incredible and gets up to 60 to 90 feet long. It is highly prized and used in many traditional ways, but really highly prized for its mineral content. And maybe I'm just saying that because I'm a nutritionist and I'm excited about the nutrition profile of kelp, which is over 50 different types of minerals, over 100 different trace elements. It is what truly makes it a functional food, supporting our thyroid gland, which regulates our metabolism and our energy levels. And kelp does this really cool thing where it helps us to extract all of the digestive, um, it works on our digestive tract to pull out all the toxins and helps regulate our detoxification processes, which is really important. It's 10 to 20 times more higher in minerals like calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, than any land-based vegetable is. That makes superstars like kale really look like iceberg lettuce in comparison. And there are so many different uses for it. You can cut it up and put it into soups as a vegetable. You can blanch it and make it into strings like noodles for a seaweed salad. You can dry it and turn it into a powder to add into seasonings and boost your nutrient content and flavor profile of your, of your dishes. It dries really easily. But kelp also has to be harvested from clean waters. And in my opinion, it's one of the most overlooked and undervalued food sources that we know. It used to grow in abundance out here. My partner is a fisherman. He's fished these waters his entire life, and he gives testimony about watching kelp beds vanish in his lifetime. And it's not a matter of harvesting, because we can actually harvest kelp pretty sustainably. If you don't disturb the holdfast, which is home to thousands of different microorganisms, it will grow back a foot a day. And that's pretty incredible. It grows faster than any other vegetable we know, any other plant that we know. And so some other traditional uses, because I don't see a yellow light pointing at me, <laughs> are that it's an incredible uh, holder of liquids. You know, historically it would be like a water bottle. You would be able to hold water or oil or molasses if that's your thing in there. You could use it as a, a long trump line, a, um, a harpoon line. It um, can be used for nets and weaving baskets. I mean, it's incredible. You would not think about all of the different amazing human engineering that has happened around creating a relationship with this, this um, beautiful sea plant. And, um, and I guess, you know, I'd like to say that Kelp, while well, it has all these traditional uses, is so important to be uh, homes and hiding places for sea creatures. It has a specific integral, uh, distinctive contribution to uh, the web of sea life, where you know it's home to many sea creatures, but is also when the waves beat at the the wings of of kelp, little flakes float around in the water and tiny little zooplankton eat that, eat those, flank, those little flakes. Those tiny zooplankton eat the flakes and then salmon and whales eventually eat that. And so when you think about it, kelp is really where that beautiful omega-3 fatty acid, that beautiful pink flesh of the salmon is derived from. And I wanna leave you with that thought, how this integral part of the web of life is meaningful to so many things, to tiny zooplankton, to the beautiful salmon people, and to us humans. It's worth caring about, and it's precious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you so much, Valerie. So I, kelp sounds like a superfood, but when I think of kelp, the way that I, I, I find it at the store, it's usually an ice cream or toothpaste. It seems like it's just an additive. Why aren't we utilizing it? Is there some kind of stigma, do you think, to, to consuming kelp in a different kind of way? 
I think so. I think people think it's stinky and gross, and it's not. You can powder it and hide it right into things, and people will never know. Into your ice cream and your toothpaste, right? We have it every day. But you can so easily add it into soups and just boost your nutrient content right there. That sounds amazing. And I kind of wish we had some kelp pickles uh, for, uh, for you all this evening. That would have been a, a, a no-brainer, right? What's wrong with us? Thank you so much, Valerie. If Thank you have you. questions for Valerie uh, and you're online, please do drop those in the chat. If you are in person, please jot a few notes down. We're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Kathleen Hurley, uh, Senior Environmental Program Manager for the Port of Seattle. And Kathleen's going to talk about one of my favorite topics. I just love the idea that there are forests right here in the city and that we walk by them every single day as we walk up and down the waterfront. And when you're leaving today, look over the side and you'll see them, uh, these urban kelp forests. Kathleen, are you ready to tell us more? I sure am. All right, take it away. Thank you. Good evening. I am here to talk to you about today about kelp forests and the urban environment that are holding fast in a context where kelp beds are diminishing in distribution and abundance throughout Puget Sound. And as the former, as we just heard, kelp is amazing. It is host to hundreds, if not thousands, of organisms. It has an incredibly fast growth rate. It's utilized by birds such as blue heron and cormorants, fish like salmonids and rockfish, and fundamentally is the base of an important, incredible food web here in Puget Sound that ultimately supports our resident killer whales. Additionally, they're incredibly important for coastal protection as the kelp dissipate waves as they approach the coastline, helping prevent coastal erosion. Additionally, they're very important for nearshore carbon and nitrogen cycling, critically important in this time of ocean acidification, and Puget Sound is incredibly vulnerable to ocean acidification. So kelp are incredibly important for our system. Looking at this slide here, this demonstrates kelp distribution and trends over a number of years. On your left-hand side is a, is a survey from 1978, and you can see all that yellow, the, that represents kelp from 1978 distribution. And then on the right-hand side, that's a more recent study, and you can see that there's much less yellow, and so that dem demonstrates our loss of kelp in the broader Puget Sound. Zooming in a little bit more, here, you can see that there's pink and blue. Blue is a historic extent. This is a survey that Washington DNR undertook in 2017 and 2018. Pink is the remaining kelp beds. We also have accounts from the Samish Indian Nation, the Suquamish Tribe, and our Washington State DNR, among other groups that have indicated that we've had loss of kelp throughout Puget Sound. It's all but disappeared from Bainbridge Island, as well as from south of the Tacoma Narrows. However, there is a bit of a silver lining, silver lining. What we're seeing here along the waters of Seattle and Elliott Bay and East and West Waterway are signs of kelp forests that are surviving in seemingly inhospitable environments. This photo here is from the East Waterway, and if you look carefully, you can see bulbs of kelp floating on the surface. So critically, our question is, well, can this kelp tell us something about resilience of kelp populations within Puget Sound more broadly? Can it help us think more broadly about restoration and protection of kelp within Puget Sound? In 2021, or 2001, excuse me, DNR undertook a survey in El Elliott Bay. Here, the yellow indicates patchy kelp beds the, uh, on the left-hand side. The brown indicates um, continuous kelp beds. And one thing to notice is on the right-hand side, the letter C, there's a kelp bed there that actually didn't exist in 2001, and it continues to grow to this day. So what are we doing? The Port of Seattle has partnered with a number of different agencies to help investigate these urban kelp beds and better understand why they're here, why they're thriving. We're doing this in situ with an underwater ROV, and scuba surveys, we're also using satellite imagery to look at historic extent as well as monitor uh, current extent of kelp beds. This research will help inform not only port efforts, but state and regional efforts to improve our nearshore environment. We couldn't do this without our partners, such as Washington DNR, Ecology, 
the Seattle Aquarium, the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, and others. Thank you, and I hope this has inspired you to take a closer look at our kelp beds right outside the door today. Thank you so much, Kathleen. You know, kelp grows so fast, it seems like a prime candidate for restoration. If you can make the sort of the, the conditions ideal for that growth, is that sort of one of those things that, that is the primary focus of that study? It's one of them. And we have been partnering not only with the Seattle Aquarium on this, but also the Puget Sound Restoration Fund on a number of kelp restoration efforts. I think the other aspect is creating conditions in which kelp might want to settle. So, so understanding the type of substrate that they might prefer, the type of water regime. And as I think we'll hear from other folks, um, thinking about the types of stressors and the physical environment that might be best for their, uh, th their um, thriving. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen will be back a little bit later for Q&A, so don't forget to write down some, some additional questions. Uh, chat them down on your sticky notes or drop them into the chat. Our next speaker is Brooke Weigel. Brooke is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington's Friday Harbor Labs. And Brooke is studying how environmental stressors affect the health of kelp forest communities. And in fact, Brooke is sort of uh, squeezing us in, in between experiments up at the labs, investigating exactly this topic. So Brooke, are you ready to tell us more? I am ready. Thank uh, you for the introduction. All right, take it away. All right, so welcome everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about the effects of ocean warming on kelp forests. Bull kelp, whose scientific name is Neriocystis leucayana, creates enormous underwater forests. There's more than 23 species of kelp in Washington, shown on this poster here, but there's only two kelp that we call canopy-forming kelp because they grow from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the surface, reaching heights of up to 80 feet tall, and one of them is the bull kelp. Now, you've already heard a bit about the importance culturally and environmentally of kelp um, in Puget Sound. And the waters in what we call the Salish Sea, which encompasses Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia up in Canada, the waters here have been warming, um, just like they are all around the world right now. So this is a little graph showing sea surface temperatures from last August. And you can see that in some parts of southern Puget Sound, the temperatures are getting red, meaning they get really hot. And they're also getting pretty warm at the top of the San Juan Islands, up at the top of the graph, because of the outflow from the Fraser River. So I'm really interested in my research in figuring out what the impact of this warming water is on kelp. But to understand that, first you need to know a little bit about the life cycle of kelp, because it's not all what you see at the surface. Bull kelp have a really cool and weird life cycle. There's the giant adult kelp sporophyte, which can grow up to 80 feet tall in the ocean. And in the middle of the summer, it forms these reproductive sori patches, if you ever see dark chocolate brown patches on the kelp. These reproductive patches release microscopic zoospores, which then settle to the bottom of the ocean and germinate into male and female gametophytes. Now I'll stop here. Think about if our eggs and sperm exited our bodies and lived for a year without us. That's what's happening here. The, the gametophytes are essentially a different life history stage that lives independent of the adult kelp for up to a year. So they're living over on the bottom of the ocean during the winter. The male fe fertilizes the female and it germinates into a juvenile kelp, which then grows into the adult kelp in just one year. This is an annual kelp. And in order to understand how temperature is affecting kelp, you really need to look across the entire life cycle from those microscopic kelp on the bottom of the ocean all the way to the 80 foot tall kelp at the top of the ocean, because we all know that the water is warmer at the surface than at the bottom, so that might affect the kelp differently. 
So first I'll tell you a little bit about how high temperatures impact those microscopic kelp at the bottom of the ocean. To look at this, I go out and collect those brown sori patches from the kelp, then I bring them back to my lab at Friday Harbor Labs in the San Juan Islands, and I grow these baby kelp in temperature-controlled tanks from 60 to almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And what I've found is that these baby kelp really do like colder temperatures. These are graphs from the, these are photos from the microscope, and you can see that these baby kelp under the microscope grow really well at 50, 54, even 57 degrees Fahrenheit. By 60 degrees, they're still doing okay. There's still some um, completion of the life cycle. But by 64 degrees, they're really not doing so well, and they pretty much aren't there by 68 degrees. Um, so that's something about how temperature affects the, the microscopic guys on the bottom of the ocean. But what about those 80-foot tall kelp that reach the surface? Um, you know, you can't really put an 80-foot tall kelp in a tank unless you're at the Seattle Aquarium, but I am not. So we have to find a creative way to study them in the lab. So we go out and we collect some photosynthetic blades of the kelp, which continue to live and grow for weeks if they're detached from the um, main part of the kelp. And this is my research team. Uh, we just finished an experiment yesterday. <laughs> so a uh, quick transition. And we brought the kelp into the lab. And we grew them at these different temperatures, 54, 60, and 68 degrees. And you can see that the kelp um, really grew well at 54 and 60, but they uh, did not grow so well at the warmest temperature. So warm temperatures, bad for adult kelp. Um, and despite all of this research, finding that climate change might have negative impacts, I want to leave you with the positive note <laughs> that I'm looking at these kelp growth rate. across Utilize populations, birds, such as trying parent, to find more parent, resilient populations like that we could use and to restore places where kelp are degraded. Incredible food web so you were now you were totally <laughs> over, but I had to hear what the leaving us on a positive note thing was, right? Can't leave without that. So thank you so much, Brooke. Brooke is there a, are you sort of um, inching towards understanding a threshold past which, you know, the warming of the sound will not be hospitable to kelp at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the temperature tolerance of these kelp and trying to understand sort of what their maximum temperature tolerance is. That is the idea. But then we're also looking at temperature in Puget Sound in the water to understand places where kelp might do well because places like the San Juan Islands are still very, very cold. And so there's lots of places where kelp are growing really well. Um, and then other places like Southern Puget Sound that are getting quite warm. So in order to really understand the bigger picture, you need to look at temperature tolerance at these different sites. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, Brooke will be back later. And so if, if her presentation spurred some questions, start to jot those down, drop them in the chat. Our next speaker is the Seattle Aquarium's own Zach Randell. Zach is a research scientist in our Department of Conservation Programming and Partnerships. Now Zach's gonna talk a little bit about the innovative methods and tools that the aquarium and its partners are using to collect data in these kelp forest communities. Zach, are you ready to tell us more? Yes, sir. All right, take it away. All right, well, hello, folks. Uh, thanks to those of you who have joined us in person, and hello to those of you who are online. Uh, my name is Zachary Randell, and I'm, today I'm gonna talk to you about how we go about studying kelp forests in the field, including some methods that we're developing here at the Seattle Aquarium. So first off, scientific scuba diving. This is a method that is near and dear to my heart. That's how I got involved in marine biology. And there's no substitute for putting a diver in the water that's working on the seafloor. You can get your head under a crevice. You can shine a flashlight. You can find really cryptic hidden species. But there's a serious limitation. So we can find a lot of species. We'll have these little bars here qualitatively representing. And uh, 
The downside of scientific divers, though, we carry around our gas on our back that we breathe. It's life support. We can't cover that much territory. Think about the scale of a coastline compared to the scale in which you can swim around. So there's a lot of territory we're not surveying. Another method, uh, kelp canopy surveillance. So satellites and airplanes can go and take photos of kelp that reach the sea surface. Not all of them do, but some species form these beautiful canopies that are visible um, from the air. And that has allowed us to ask questions across a massive scale, literally a global scale. But not all species reach the sea surface. There are lots of understory kelp species which are not visible uh, with these forms of imagery. And of course, a satellite is not gonna detect fish or invertebrates. So is there a middle ground? Is there a way to expand the area in which we are capturing information, but still obtain information about fish, invertebrates, and kelp? Enter ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. Uh, these are typically large, expensive, bulky, impressive pieces of engineering which require a large vessel to be deployed off of. Uh, they are not suitable for nearshore, shallow, coastal operations, and that's where we find kelp forests. That is, until recent technological advances, the latest models that are on the market, we can get a device that's relatively inexpensive. We can customize it heavily with sensors and sonar and GPS and cameras and lights, and we can deploy it off of a small vessel, as you can see here. And so we won't be able to peek under all the ledges with a flashlight that a diver can, but we're still gonna capture many of the invertebrates, the fish, the algae that are underwater. And crucially, we're gonna be able to expand that area that we're collecting data beyond the locations that divers alone could survey. So, as you heard from Kathleen, in conjunction with the Port of Seattle and other partners, we're in the process of developing the methods to use these ROVs to go out and survey kelp forests. We're gonna survey kelp abundance, so how many individuals there are in distribution, where they are, as well as other species that are present in the kelp forest. Uh, species that may compete with kelp, species that live within or consume kelp for food, as well as we'll also survey what is the habitat. So we're, we're taking photo and video records of all of this so we can calculate and extract what, what is the kelp growing on? Is it growing on sand, cobble, bedrock, silt, um, man-made structures? And so we'll try to better understand what environmental variables and species associate with healthy kelp forests. The whole point of this is to help further restoration efforts so we can go out and help these populations recover, not just in Elliott Bay and Puget Sound, but the broader state of Washington. So with that, the very last idea I wanna leave you with is that I'm not trying to say any one platform of data collection is better than another. Think about a monitoring program where we integrate all of those sensor platforms. We have divers going down to collect the fine scale detailed information to locate the cryptic species. We have ROVs capturing broader patterns along the seafloor. And then we have satellites and aerial imagery capturing the global patterns of kelp bed formation. And so with that, I wanna thank you all. Um, shout out to Port of Seattle, Jefferson County, Sea Otter Foundation and Trust for support. And thanks to everyone at the Seattle Aquarium for helping to make this project happen. Thank you so much, Zach. Now, Zach, I know that I've seen you launch this ROV right off of the pier here. So what is there to see right around here from a kelp perspective? Yes, there's kelp growing right offshore here. Um, it's, it's growing on some man-made structures we just saw with Kathleen the past week. Kelp was growing on, we couldn't identify exactly what it is, but man-made structures. There's pilings down there that are covered in beautiful anemones. There's an, a surprising amount of life right offshore. That's great. Thank you so much, Zach. Now, our anchor speaker is Hillary Hayford from the Puget Sound Restoration Fund. Now, the Puget Sound Restoration Fund is taking a cue from the complex ecologies of the ecosystems that they study and bringing together a multifaceted network of people who can not only monitor but help protect these kelp forest habitats. Are you, are you ready to bring us home, Hillary? Ready, Jim. All right. Take it away. I 
I hope that at some point in your life, you've had the opportunity or will have the opportunity to look out over cool, temperate waters and see a thick blanket of floating kelp. Here in the Salish Sea, the vast majority of that floating kelp is bull kelp, which floats its long blades up to the surface where they can absorb sunlight and conduct photosynthesis. Deeper, you'll see that not only is this a food source, but this is a habitat-forming species. This kelp fundamentally alters the water column by providing three-dimensional structure and changing the flow and chemistry of the water. And because of that, many species will be associated with bull kelp, including numerous species of fishes, and down at the bottom, a number of different invertebrates and algae that humans value for a variety of reasons, including because they provide food, are beautiful, or because we recognize their specific ecological importance. The important thing here is that that kelp forest community of organisms is facilitated by the kelp's presence itself. And we already know the unfortunate story is that globally kelps have begun to decline, likely around the mid-1900s. But fortunately, that's not in all places. We do have patchiness in kelp decline. So locally, and I want to emphasize this, there are many places in Washington where our kelp forests are doing great. But we do have significant problems in southern Puget Sound. Near Olympia, we've lost more than 80% of historic kelp beds. And to a lesser extent, as you heard this evening, in some places of Puget Sound as well. While we're taking in this map, I want to draw your attention to the fact that these problem areas are really far from the influence of the ocean and really close to the influence of urbanization. So we don't know exactly what is causing decline in our area, but these facts provide clues for us as we start to look into potential or likely stressors. You already heard about high temperature. Another candidate is changes in seawater chemistry, such as nutrient pollution or not the right type of nutrients, not enough. There may be an increase in animals that feed on kelp or possibly a decrease in animals that eat those animals that feed on kelp. Most likely, it's a combination of factors, but what we know is that for the system to function, it must have all the parts in balance. And if one part is thrown off balance, it, the impact will be felt throughout. So that's where we are now, at least in some places. One of the actions that Puget Sound Restoration Fund is taking is experimental seeding outplant of kelp where we put the kelp seed on aquaculture lines and we're able to grow it up each summer to the full height. So this represents projects that we've been working on with the Suquamish tribe and Port of Seattle and NOAA for the last several years. But in order for us to take this and make this widespread application, we have to know what factors are causing that decline so that we can choose the correct methods and effective locations for doing this restoration. We also need to know whether this forest that we're creating will develop the same community as these naturally occurring kelp beds. And so to address these data gaps, we're building a broad network of people with different perspectives and skills to go in big on underwater monitoring. We this year launched the Eyes on Kelp Initiative with support from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. At dozens of sites around Washington each summer, we will have scuba divers, including volunteer divers, that will use, even though they're in different groups, the same protocols to assess the kelp forest, including counting fishes, algae, invertebrates, and things that are occupying the bottom, whether those are living or sand. This will help us to understand the rich kelp resources that we have and importantly track the changes going into the future. At a subset of these sites at 14 places, we will be able to put instruments in the water so that we could compare the temperature between a robust and a troubled kelp site to help us make better hypotheses about what is causing this decline. 
and importantly, we'll build a coalition of people that care about kelp. So thank you to our partners and supporters who have generously worked on this project. Thank you so much, Hillary. The, um, it sounds like this is an incredible coalition to, to try to, to, it's like, all, like many hands make light work. Uh, is there, like who's still out there? Who do you need to connect with? Is there, are there gaps in your network that you, you, you all are thinking about trying to fill right now? I don't know that I could name a particular gap, but I can say there's room everywhere. So we are working with aquariums, we are working with research groups, we are working with community science divers. There, this is just getting off the ground in the last few months, and there is a place for any particular person or type of person who wants to get involved. That's fantastic. I have a feeling that, that people are going to be asking a lot about volunteer opportunities tonight. Thank you so much, Hillary. Can we get one round of applause for all of our speakers this evening? I just, I can't get enough of live applause. Applause emoji are nice in the chat, but there's just, they're just not quite the same. Now, we're gonna be going into the Q&A portion of the evening. This is really my favorite part because it's our opportunity to really dig a little bit deeper. So if you all have questions online, I know you've been putting them in the chat because I already have a list of really cool questions that I'm planning to work into our conversation up here. If you all have questions here in our audience, either raise your hand or jot them down and we'll have them pulled in there as well. Uh, if you're in the live audience, just have a little patience with us as we try to, to juggle both the online and the in-person questions. Now, but before we get started, what invariably happens is as these speakers are all talking, they're all working on kelp, they're all thinking about kelp all the time, and so they, they always have questions for each other, and so that's where I wanna start. Do, do any of you have questions for your fellow speakers? I have a question. Um, so uh, you mentioned that there are kelp in Elliott Bay that weren't there in the 2001 survey that appeared in 2021. Um, do you know if there's any difference in like the structure on the bottom or anything that might have led to that presence of kelp? That's a great question. Thanks, Brooke. So that kelp bed is located in front of Centennial Park and Myrtle Edwards Park, and many of you here maybe have even walked there and seen that kelp floating. And we have noticed that kelp bed over the last few years. We first um, counted bulbs with PSRF last year. And one thought is that there's a large, there's riprap slope there. And perhaps over that 20 year time period, some of that material has migrated um, to further out into the water and created some, some ideal substrate for those kelp. Um, our work with the Seattle Aquarium this year and next year will, help, will tell us a little bit more about what that substrate looks like and hopefully can uh, provide a, a more, better understanding as to what kind of substrates there as well as um, other physical and or environmental conditions. Awesome, thank you. So when you're, when you're thinking about that ideal substrate, right? So we, they talked about the kelp plant, it has the hold fast. And that hold fast needs to hold on to something, right? So when we're modifying a bay or with a, with a seawall or, or something like that, it scours out and it's just silty, we're, is, we're probably not gonna see much kelp there. Is that fair to say? Does, has any, has anyone tried like a, you know, sometimes we provide artificial bottom for for various kinds of creatures to, to attach to and settle on is, are like artificial reef structures or our, our, our man-made structures, are those, do they seem like they're potentially beneficial to trying to restore kelp? And that's a question for anybody. I'll jump in there. Uh, I, I definitely think there's potential and there's a lot of work, uh, particularly in Southern California that have pioneered artificial reefs for kelp growth, a, a different kelp species, Macrocystis, but they, they've had success down there and that may be a, a direction um, for exploration here. Uh, I, I'd also like to say that in addition to hard substrate, it's just amazing to see what bull kelp, kelp will grow on. Some of the early images from the ROV, we have um, the bull kelp that's been lifted off the seafloor, but the holdfast is still attached to what it was growing on. And it was growing on a shell 
a mussel shell. It doesn't take much for it to start growing. And oftentimes what it's growing, if it's not uh, heavy or attached, it may start floating away. So small rocks, shells. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what everything is growing on with our surveys this and next year. That's interesting, like, like almost a migrating kelp bed, depending on what it's attached to. So Valerie, I've got a couple of questions. You, you have sparked the imagination of the audience about where they can get more kelp. Uh, are there, like if, there, if people are interested in kelp pickles or kelp powder or are other things besides, you know, like toothpaste, like where would they go to look for that kind of stuff? Um, I, well, and I guess that was gonna be my question for everyone up here is the, the, has there been a toxicology study done or are you including that in all of the studies that you're doing with kelp to know if it's safe to harvest here? Mm -hmm. Because if we're, if we're gonna invest in growing it, um, why not consider it as also a food source that, that could be really sustainable as it grows faster than any other land plant, land vegetable plant, so. Yeah, does anybody know toxicology studies on, uh, on kelp? So there, as far as I know, there aren't that many on algae in general, at least for this area at this point in time. And what we are pretty dependent on is efforts by Department of Health uh, tracking shellfish and toxicology in shellfish and other types of disease that happen in the water. And so that's a really well-established system, also um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And they're doing this constantly so that we know which beaches would be safe for shellfish consumption. And they're also who monitor different aquaculture efforts. So we're reliant on those type of data right now. Perhaps there's a niche to learn more specifically about the toxicology of kelp. And then I'd throw out that I know at least last year, Awajamaya had uh, kelp products coming in from Alaska. Yes, you, you, again, you can go to a supermarket store and find uh, seaweed products on the shelf as well. Yeah. So that's, a, that's another question that came in there about, about aquaculture. Like are there, since it grows so fast, it's clearly something that's an important you know, food source, not just for animals, but also potentially for people. I think I've read in other parts of the world where they have these sort of uh, like multiple mariculture stands where they're growing shellfish and kelp and other things. Is there, has there been any interest or discussion of kelp uh, aquaculture here in the Sound? So um, I know that there is a lot of kelp farming going on in Alaska right now. There's a really big kelp farm called Seagrove, Seagrove Kelp, and there's also um, a company called Barnacle Foods that makes delicious kelp pickles and other kelp products. So lots of kelp farms in Alaska. I think we're just getting there in Washington. I think that we haven't, we don't have many kelp farms yet. There might only be one, I think. But um, I think it's a, a place for uh, room to grow, and I think that will be sort of um, a big thing in the future. Um, that's, that's what I think. And if I could add to that as well, I think that I would agree with Brooke that, that is a, there's growing interest in kelp aquaculture, and, and as you mentioned, Jim, aquaculture systems that are multi-species. Um, we are constrained a bit in Washington State at this point in time, given kind of the approvals process that exists in Alaska and I think Maine are two states that are somewhat ahead of us in terms of streamlining that permitting process, also allowing, it's, it's also helpful for small business. And however, we don't have a system yet that would allow for piloting, for example, and, and temporary approvals for that, and then you know staging that type of development. So I would expect that in the future, we'll, we'll see some evolution of that, building on those models that, that exist elsewhere in the country. Can we do answer one, ask one? Do it. <laughs> there is one um, kelp aquaculture farm in Puget Sound right now with three in the greater Salish Sea in, our, in the Washington side of it that are uh, uh, being considered in the re regulatory process. Um, but I would like to know from Valerie as a nutritionist, oftentimes you do combos to get the maximum nutritional value. Is there a food that you would recommend kelp be consumed with or a seasoning or preparation? I would say because the mineral content, um, the vita like if, if a vitamin C rich food were paired with it, it would really help 
unlock and amplify all of the abilities that minerals can, uh, our body can only extract so much. And, and then a lot of it has just kind of gone to the wayside. So if you stack function on function, like you're talking about, your question, um, vitamin C, for example, opens the door for iron to get in. And so if you were to eat, I would assume if you were to have some sort of kelp dish, you would want some vitamin C something with it. Lemon or like a lemonade or something like that. We all, there's a lot of synergy that's happening because there's another one of the questions. Are there kelp cooking classes? <laughs> Which I'm not sure the answer to that, but uh, it, kelp cooking, I think there's, a, there's just a lot of interest in how we may be able to... To, to utilize this just because because it just hasn't been in people's forefront. Um, and yet we've been using it for 14,000 years. Right. <laughs> that is, I mean, it's documented in in, um, in Chinese medicine books. It's uh, for thousands of years we've been utilizing it. So it is just, this is the, I always say this, this is the farthest humans have been removed from our source of food. Like this generation right here. We've always followed a lunar calendar. We've always known our food, those food traditions. This is globally, you know, would be handed down through generations. And, and it's up to us to pick up those recipes and pass them on to the next generation. And to do it sustainably too. I mean, you're also hearing that these are at risk, you know, um, foods, but it's a, it's a hu our human is part of this ecosystem, and we also rely on, on that food we have for 14,000 years. We know that. And so um, there, are, there are some seaweed gurus out there, you know, that are really fun to hang out with. Uh, my teacher is Jennifer Hahn. She teaches at Western Washington University and wrote a book called Pacific Feast, which is all about seaweed recipes. And, um, and also one called Spirited Waters, which is about her journey. Anyways, I'm plugging Jennifer Hahn because she's incredible. Um, Ryan Drum is another seaweed um, guru who lives up on Waldron Island and harvests and sells his seaweed online. So ryandrum.com. And sometimes they do classes in the city where you can go and learn to identify. And it's typically on a low tide day. So. That's the best way, really, is to just go outside and look, identify, spend time, look for the low tide. That's when all the colors come out. And it's not just kelp. There's so many other, so many, and, and not one is actually poisonous. Some of them taste disgusting. You wouldn't <laughs> want to eat them anyways. And some of them kind of give you a tummy ache, but you, you can't really mess up. Yeah. Nice. And, and you know, kelp just, one of the things that I find hopeful about thinking about kelp restoration is just because it grows so fast. It's obviously really good at replacing itself already. Um, but, you know, Brooke, you were talking about, you know, the stressors that are affecting, you know, kelp's ability to respond to, you know, other things that are going on. Someone was asking, is it, do you think it's, it's possible to breed a sort of heat resistant strain of kelp? Yeah, that's a really good question. So right now in my research, I am looking at different populations throughout Puget Sound and the Salish Sea to try to see if there are some kelp populations that are more resilient to high temperatures. But I would be very cautious about saying that we can breed a heat resistant super kelp because, um, you know, I think we should really be focusing on uh, conservation of the kelp that we have without thinking that there's a magic solution. Um, but I do think that we are doing a lot with genetics and we're learning about the genetic diversity of these kelp in addition to their temperature tolerance. And using that information together, we will be able to help inform management decisions about the best kelp to grow where. I know that there's some corals that they've looked at that are very particularly, um, you know, resistant to acidification. There's others that seem to be resistant to heat. And so it sounds like it's a similar strategy. So, Zach, uh, people are very curious about the using the ROV for studying kelp here in the sound. Are there, are there other research groups using the ROV similarly in other parts of the world? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are ROVs being used here in Washington by a number of groups. Uh, WDFW, for one, uh, uses them to go out and survey fish, typically a little deeper than you find kelp, um, but that's one of those slightly larger ROVs that gets deployed off a larger vessel and can spend a significant, a significant amount of time underwater. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tool that's been used classically in a number of applications and it's starting to creep into more shallow water type work. And when you're, when you're collecting data with an ROV, you're not huddled around a screen like trying to identify things, you're mostly re recording, right, for analysis later. And then how, like what's your, what's your process for analyzing that, that video after you get it? Yep, great question. Uh, so we are intending to collect a lot more data than a human would be able to review and annotate manually. So we're in the process of training AI algorithms. So we're training them to detect what a sea star is, what a sea urchin, what a kelp stipe looks like, so we can get counts, um, train the algorithm to, to extract that information from the imagery for us at scale, so we can apply those algorithms to a large data set. Uh, and we're training a, a different type of algorithm to calculate percent coverage. So things that you can't really count easily. Um, so if we want to know what the substrate is, is it sand or silt or bedrock, you can put a smattering of random points across an image and train the algorithm to detect what each one of those points is hitting. So it will be an automated process once these algorithms have been robustly trained. Nice. So the... Um I think one of the things that someone was asking from online, how do we, how do we get people on board, right? It, when we talk about deforestation, we show images of clear cut forests and you know, baby deers without homes and all of that. But, but you can look out over the sound and you can't always, you can't always get a sense uh, that it's struggling. And if you know what to look for, you might notice that there are kelp, but if there aren't kelp and you don't know that there should be kelp, like how, how do we get people more connected with this, this idea that kelp restoration is really important to the sound and, and to our, our personal health? I mean, kelp are the base of the food web, and so all of the carbon that's stored in kelp eventually makes its way into rockfish and herring and salmon. And there's people doing studies right now showing that salmon, juvenile salmon, use kelp as nursery habitat, and adult salmon have some proportion of carbon derived from kelp um, in their tissues. So kelp is literally in salmon, and it's extremely important. So if you see like the salmon not doing as well, that could be down, you know, due to the kelp forests at the bottom of the food web. So I think it's all connected. I also would add that in terms of getting people excited about kelp and understanding, I think about how we've historically thought about wetlands or we've historically thought about mangroves and other places in the world. And those were kind of considered at certain points in time, kind of throwaway ecosystems. But with research and understanding, we know that those are incredibly valuable for so many reasons, similarly to kelp. And so for non-scientists, I think we have to make kelp more relatable and understand that it's fundamental for p the health of Puget Sound, for what we all appreciate and value in this area from whether, whether we use kelp as a food source or eat salmon or enjoy seeing orca whales and appreciate their presence and of all these components to our ecosystem, fundamentally we need all of these pieces in place in order to continue to have a thriving ecosystem here, and that includes kelp. Uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Who in this room or online is excited about kelp restoration and conservation right now? For the online audience, it's like everybody. <laughs> so the, um, Brooke, I love the idea that there's, there's kelp in salmon, and we will also talk about how there's salmon in trees, right? The, the, the salmon, when, they, when, they're, when they've finished their journey, are, are absorbed into the, those forests. So you've got the land forest connected to the, to the sea forest through the salmon, and that, that interconnectedness, I think, is just as kind of a magical story. And, uh, and I love the, that we've talked about a lot of different ways that we value kelp. Um, 
and I just, I, I always think, for me, I love kelp, but I, it's, it's like the aesthetic, like, almost like spiritual peacefulness of a kelp forest. Like, I don't know if anybody ever seen the, that, that film Octopus Teacher, um, which is just this incredible, it, it's an incredible documentary about this incredibly charismatic animal, and I spent the whole time just staring at the kelp. Uh, just because it's just it it creates this this sense of of peace for me, and I think that that's like connecting with people around why they value kelp, even if it's not the economic, uh, if it's not the you know the the ecological. But I think there's some. It feels like there's something there for everyone, and that's that could be something that that we could uh, we could focus on. I, I want to as we wrap up, I would love to hear um, something that makes you hopeful about about the future of kelp in the sound. I can start. I think what makes me hopeful is that we have this amazing, we have a number of spots here in Elliott Bay and East and West Waterway where we're seeing kelp that were not documented 20 years ago. And I think there's a lot that we can potentially learn from, from these particular kelp beds and, and hopefully contribute to the statewide and region-wide science. And so I'm really excited to have urban kelp and understand more about that along with our, our partners in this. I'll jump in and uh, I, I am hopeful. I am hopeful that kelp has certainly seen some really challenging times the past few years, especially with some anomalous warm water events. But the flip side of that is that there is a heightened awareness um, among research communities, among conservationists, and, and the general public as well, that kelp needs attention. So it feels like it is receiving a fair amount of focus and, and the tools are in place, uh, both on the software end, the hardware end, and then most importantly, the, the people, the people and the partnerships, the organizations. I'm new to Washington and I'm just thrilled to be part of such a robust research, conservation, restoration community. It's, it's a privilege to be working here with all of you and, and that community gives me hope. And building on what Zach just said, what I've heard from the managers of the resource being state of Washington, local municipalities, or municipalities, I gotta say that right, um, or from the tribal resource managers is that never has there been such a large coalition of all of those different groups working on this problem at one time, or at least not in the last few decades of progress. And so there really has been, a, um, there's a good group now, and we're gonna try and run with it for, as, to, to success. Um, I, this is hopeful for me, and to your point, the, it's gonna take all of us to fix the problem, and it's gonna take seeing ourselves as humans as being an integral part of the ecosystem and not continue to perpetuate that very pervasive idea that we are separate from or we need to, you know, look at, like, our, our action and our commitment is what our ancestors have always done. All of us globally, not just mine, we've always carried on these traditions and handed them down. And now we're in a food system that's pretty transactional, that tells us what to eat and we give money and we get the food and we go home and eat it. But being an integral part of it, being a part of the good management that needs to happen, whether it be keeping your water clean or you know harvesting sustainably and ethically, like that's what it's gonna take. Um, and I feel like that's happening, that consciousness is rising. And it's events like this and champions like you all that are making it happen too. So I, I really value you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everybody. And I have pretty much just wanna echo that Kelp is really having a moment right now, and I feel all this energy from all of you. And, um, you know, when I'm out doing field work and I'm on the beach, sometimes I start talking to people and they know what kelp is already. Like, there's so much spread of information right now, and people are really excited about kelp forests. And so that's a really good thing. And research funding is increasing for kelp forests because we're realizing that they're so important. and. Um, I think that energy just gives me a lot of hope. 
Can we give our speakers one more round of applause? Thanks again to our speakers. That's all we have time for tonight. Thank you all for being here tonight. It was fantastic to have the energy in the room again. Uh, if you all enjoy programs like these, do think about a donation to the Seattle Aquarium. Lightning Talks is just one example of the kind of community programming that the Seattle Aquarium hopes to share with, uh, with Seattle and of course with the rest of the world as well. Now, we've had a great season of Lightning Talks. We've talked about sharks. We've explored the deep sea. Uh, we've soared high in the air and swum deep in the, the sea with seabirds. And of course, we finished tonight with the kelp forests and we're looking forward to another season of lightning talks we'll be back in the fall if you all have ideas for topics or, or critters that you'd like us to cover then please leave us a note on the table or drop an idea in the chat send us a message across any of our socials we're really excited to hear about your ideas so we make sure that we're bringing things to you that are of value and certainly there's there's no end to the kind of stuff that we get really excited to talk about and bring to you as well. Now, you can watch any of our past Lightning Talk events on our YouTube channel where you can also conveniently like and subscribe, help us sail past that 10,000 subscriber goal. So happy to have you all. Thank you for being here tonight and have a good evening. <laughs>